Hey everyone, if you love listening to Curbsiders and want to enhance the experience, then now is a great time to join the Curbsiders Patreon with new annual memberships where you can save 10% off the monthly rate. You'll have the option to hear all the episodes ad-free plus twice monthly bonus episodes. You can sign up at patreon.com slash curbsiders. This is a great way to use that CME money that's probably burning a hole in your pocket plus support the show so we can keep bringing you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, mini series like teach and addiction medicine, our digest newsletter, and of course, expand our video content. So join the Cashlack family today at patreon.com slash curbsiders. Moni and Meredith, I think it's really time as a new producer to really, you know, get my feet wet as a producer. So let's do this. Okay. Wah, wah. <laughs> Just kidding. I tried. I tried. I tried. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. But more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to Curbsiders, another inpatient episode. I am Dr. Moni Amin, joined by my effervescent co-host, Dr. Meredith Trubet. How are you this evening? Doing pretty well, Moni. How about yourself? You know, I'm living the dream, and everyone's going to find out why soon. Mm-hmm. On tonight's episode, we discuss diabetic foot infections with the great Dr. Andrew Webster. In just a minute, our new producer, Dr. RJ Blackburn, will tell you a little bit more about our guest and himself and the topic. But first, Meredith, will you remind the audience what it is we do on this show. Sure, Moni, I'd love to. We are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as you already mentioned, we have our new guest producer, RJ Blackburn. So RJ, why don't you introduce yourself and then you can tell us a little bit more about our guest tonight, Dr. Webster. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me, Moni and Meredith. Uh, so I am a internal medicine physician at Lake Cumberland Regional Hospital in Somerset, Kentucky right now, and I'm the associate program director for their uh, freestanding rural internal medicine residency. Um, I'm interested in all things tech, uh, 3D printing, just pretty much technology nerd. So love that and love the curbsider. So I'm um, fangirling that I get to be on, on, on an episode right now. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and we have a fantastic conversation with our guest tonight, Dr. Andrew Webster. He is an infectious disease physician at the Atlanta VA Medical Center, where he serves as the director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. He completed his infectious disease and medical microbiology fellowships at Emory and has particular interest in medical education and diagnostic stewardship. On tonight's show, he teaches us a comprehensive approach to the diabetic foot infection with a focus on diagnostic workup and antibiotic therapy, learning who really needs that MRI and when to call your surgical colleagues, and who exactly needs the pseudomonas and anaerobic coverage anyway. And a reminder that this and most episodes will be available for free CME critic for all healthcare professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. So without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, Andrew, thanks for coming on the show. We're super pumped to have you here. And we're just going to kind of start with some rapid fire questions so everyone can kind of get to know you a little better. Can you start with a bit of a one liner? Uh, Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for having me. Very happy to be here. Um, So I am 36 years old. I'm an infectious disease physician and uh, board certified microbiology nerd. Uh, whose love of all things uh, ID and trivia related are eclipsed only by my family, uh, which includes uh, two spastastic children aged six and three. Um, And then I also have a borderline pathologic love for baseball. And it's baseball season. It is. uh, My team is the Texas Rangers, and we're off to one of our best starts uh, in history. It's been very exciting to watch despite the loss of our big free agent pitcher acquisition. So um, a lot of baseball watching so far. Andrew, we have to talk about this offline. I'm a Rangers fan too. So I'm actually going home this weekend and we're going to the game. Uh, I was going to say you're speaking her love language right now. 
There we baseball. go. Yeah. I don't know how we so, don't know this. I don't know either. I'm like really shocked. Yeah, she's really weird about Texas. I think it's because I went um, to Texas A&M and I've seen you in, in UT gear. And so I, mm-hmm. I may have just... We probably uh, just don't address it. Yeah. Yeah, that feels right. Um, okay. Any like books, movies, or anything else that you would recommend for people? Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I just finished two books, actually. So, one a nonfiction book was actually called the baseball 100 by Joe Posnanski. who's one of my favorite sports writer who kind of makes an arbitrary list of the greatest hundred baseball players. And it's basically like nothing but baseball trivia, which was amazing and fun to read, but probably not for everybody. Um, my most recent fiction book I read was actually uh, project hail Mary by Andy Weir. Who's the same author who wrote the Martian. Um, and it's like in a similar vein of like hard science fiction. Um, but it was a pretty incredible book. I'm actually rereading it for the third time right now. And it is uh, making its way into my top five books of all time. So I definitely recommend that for any like science fiction fans out there. Awesome. Yeah. Joe Poznanski wrote for the Kansas City Star when I was growing up in Kansas City. One of my favorite sports writers there um, wrote like some of my favorite articles I've ever read about like Coach Bill Self, actually. But anyway, uh, Meredith, shall we do some picks of the week? We should. Maybe you should go first. <laughs> so um, this is going to air much later than this happened. So it'll be old news for everyone except me still. Uh, so as um, some of you may know, the new Kelly Clarkson album came out on June 23rd. It's called Chemistry. And she was going to be putting out, she did a album signing in New York. And so I, of course, as a dedicated fan and also it being my birthday, was going to be there for that. So I won't get into too many of the details of how this happened, but a friend of mine who is also a Kelly Clarkson fan lives in New York and has some connections at the record label. And she got me into a pre-album release party that involved Kelly Clarkson. And I thought it was just she was going to show up, do a little toast, blessing her album. Homegirl did karaoke with the fans for an hour and a half. And I did karaoke with Kelly Clarkson, Too Stronger, which is in my top five Kelly Clarkson songs of all time. So yeah, that's my pick of the week, Meredith. (laughs) Yeah. And if anyone wants to know what a whiplash looks like, it's seeing Moni come back to work after having just done that the weekend before. (laughs) I was pretty sad. Um, That was pretty sad. But I was really glad to be back around my friends because I did miss the I did miss the VA crew, at least my friends. So uh But Meredith, what's your pick of the week? I know you've been holding on to this one for a hot minute. Yeah. And I just wanted you to go because mine's also sports related. And so I wasn't sure if it was two sports topics with Andrew. But um, my father-in-law recommended this book. um, So shout out to Doug. Um, But it's called um, Loving Sports When They Don't Love You Back. And essentially, like each chapter kind of talks about different kind of like ethical sort of conundrums that you deal with that sports deal with so like when the mascot's racist like how do you kind of like rationalize through that or um different things like that and each chapter goes through something else and kind of the like history of it and all of these things and uh the book speaks to me but i know it's also going to speak to moni because we often have these conversations um also so um it's been it's a great book it's not like super long or like um, heavy, but it just kind of weighs like how do people rationalize through that and kind of what's the psychology of it and all those things. So highly recommend. It's been really good so far. I like it. Um, RJ, not to put you on the spot, do you have a pick of the week? If you don't, definitely. that's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah, definitely nothing as cool as you all. Uh, you know, I've not I've not been to any Kelly Clarkson parties and singing singing karaoke with with Kerry, Kelly Clarkson, but uh, uh, I just I feel like a nerd. I also haven't been reading either, but uh, I've been really big into three D printing recently. So, uh, but uh, I don't think that's good enough for pick of the week. So we can no. What's your What's your most recent three D print? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I live in a rural area, so I had a neighbor come up and say, hey, this 50 year old tractor I have, uh, the knob on it broke and no one has a replacement part for it. So can you reverse engineer it for me? And uh, it was pretty awesome and even customized it with a logo for his particular brand of tractor and and got it to him. He was super happy about it. So, oh man, felt pretty good. RJ, this is, 
This has given me some throwbacks to our like late night conversations on night float as interns about whatever like techie stuff you were up to. So yeah, just yeah. so so good to know that things have not changed. No, it, it literally is a pick of the week for me. This week it's 3D printing. Next week it'll it'll be something else tech, but uh, obviously not uh, GarageBand or anything audio related, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, RJ, can you please take us to our first case from Cashlack? Absolutely, Moni. So. We have a case from Cashlack Memorial. The patient, Oliver Footington, is a 65-year-old male with type 2 diabetes mellitus. He's had diabetes for 20 years and has been poorly controlled for most of that time. He is overweight and has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease. He smokes approximately one pack of cigarettes per day for about 30 years. He presents to the emergency department with a two-week history of pain and swelling in his right foot and the development of a wound. He reports that the pain is worse when he walks and that he has been unable to put weight on that foot. He also reports that the area around the wound is red, warm, and tender. On physical exam, the patient has a two-centimeter ulcer on the plantar surface of his right foot. The ulcer is deep and has purulent drainage. There is surrounding erythema, warmth, and tenderness. His vital signs are stable, and his white blood cell count is 12,000. The emergency department obtained an x-ray of the patient's right foot that shows no evidence of bone involvement. All right. So, Andrew, um, I guess our first question, obviously, is does, does this case represent a typical scenario that you might encounter for a patient presenting with a diabetic foot infection? Uh, definitely. Uh, this, this absolutely sounds like a typical case for a, a diabetic foot infection or, or DFI. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds like a relatively straightforward definition, but um, I, I think really when someone says diabetic foot infection, it kind of, you know, to me paints a little bit of a different picture. Um, so an infection, obviously, meaning, you know, usually the cardinal signs of inflammation when you're dealing with soft tissue infections. So, you know, things like uh, redness, warmth, uh, tenderness, swelling, of which Mr. Footington had multiple. Um, and for a diabetic foot infection, those signs of infection um, occur in association with some sort of soft tissue defect or injury. Um, and I think classically, we think of the diabetic foot ulcer, um, which is probably the most common uh, skin breakdown that you'll encounter with a diabetic foot infection. But um, these infections can also occur in the setting of trauma. Um, and so I think we've probably all had a, a diabetic patient who, you know, develops a callus and takes into his own hands and people get very creative with, with how they uh, deal with these things on their own. And so um, there could also be, you know, kind of this uh, element of trauma, which then leads to infection. But um, really, I think about it as, as you know, association of a, a soft tissue injury with signs of infection below the ankle in a person with diabetes. And that's kind of how I would think of it. And so in Mr. Footington's case, he, he kind of has all those features for us to call it a diabetic foot infection. Um, and we also kind of get some clues about some risk factors for diabetic foot infection as well. We know he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, coronary artery disease, so he may have some other vascular disease. He's a 30-pack year history smoker, um, so he definitely has the right risk factors. He's definitely presenting with the right clinical scenario, so this is very typical for what we would see. So you're just talking about some of the risk factors that he may have. How do you risk stratify or consider kind of like classify the severity of the infection uh, for these patients? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and I and I do think it's important to kind of classify the wounds and, and do so consistently. There was, you know, historically a lot of different definitions in, in terms of you know risk stratifying or classifying these diabetic foot infections, but um, thankfully, um, you know, most of the new guidelines kind of have a consensus definition that's very similar. Uh, kind of regardless of which guidelines you're looking at. So the IDSA guidelines, the International Working Group for the Diabetic Foot, um, you know, a lot of other scoring systems all kind of incorporate the same features. And so um, when you're trying to classify a diabetic foot infection, um, there's usually kind of four different points on the scale. So the lowest one um, would be no infection. Um, and then you have mild infections, which are typically confined to the superficial soft tissues. 
Um, and then also less than two centimeters of that erythema um, from the edge of the wound. Um, so in other words, relatively mild inflammation associated with the wound. A moderate infection uh, would be an infection that extends either greater than two centimeters from the wound edge or involves deeper structures, which can include bone. Um, and then the marker of a severe infection would be essentially signs of sepsis or signs of systemic inflammation, um, which for definitions of diabetic foot um, still rely on kind of the SERS criteria. So are they, are they tachycardic? Um, are they tachypnic? Do they have fever or do they have significant leukocytosis? And so um, for Mr. Footington, we don't have a, a specific measurement uh, per se of the amount of erythema, but we know it's a relatively large two centimeter ulcer. It's described as deep with purulent infection. Um, and so I think we could probably pretty safely say that this would be a moderate infection. I think you could start to argue a little bit with that white count of 12,000 um, that is he's starting to get towards severe, but with normal vital signs, I think I would classify this as a, a moderate foot infection. And um, that's important um, because that has implications for how you would manage it. And in thinking about other physical exam findings, is it all kind of localized to the wound itself and kind of vital signs? Or is there anything else that you would be looking for for him? Like, i.e., should I be bringing out the monofilament during this situation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, you know, things like diabetic neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease are commonly going to be present um, in someone with a diabetic foot infection. Um, and so, I mean, it's important to note those, but those are generally going to be present, particularly neuropathy, Perfer peripheral arterial disease, um, you know, may be present in slightly less than half of people presenting with diabetic foot infection, but neuropathy is going to be a very common feature. Um, and so you can kind of restrict, stratify a little bit by the severity of those findings, um, you know, particularly the presence of peripheral arterial disease. So um, if they have clinical signs that are concerning for lower perfusion, um, that kind of increases the risk of developing a more significant infection or having an infection, which may lead to um, a, a more morbid outcome such as amputation. And I think the on the physical exam also, you know, on previous episodes um, where we've talked a little bit about um, diabetic feet, although it's been several years since that episode, um, one of the like exam findings was, you know, for the at risk um, diabetic foot, like having bounding pulses and things like that. Can we just maybe differentiate? if you're still looking for some of those physical exam findings or once they're already hospitalized in this more moderate to severe infection, are those exam findings still um, as useful to you? Yeah. So it, I, I actually went back and did listen to that episode, um, which is a great episode. And, and certainly for those of you who are listening to this episode, if you haven't listened to the old episode on the examination of the diabetic foot, it's certainly worth a listen um, in terms of assessing the high risk diabetic foot. Um, I think once someone is presenting um, clinically like Mr. Footington is, which, you know, looks like a, a moderate severity diabetic foot infection, you know, using some of the features that might identify an at-risk infection or, sorry, an at-risk foot uh, is a little bit of a moot point because we he's no longer at risk. He actually has the complication that we were worried about and in, in trying to identify risk factors for earlier. So um, I think the main one that I'm, I'm concerned about, again, neuropathy is going to be a common finding. You can confirm that, but a lot of people are going to have it. Mr. Footington still has pain, so maybe his neuropathy isn't significant. Um, but the thing that I would be most concerned about in terms of kind of assessing would be the vascular supply. For the listeners, it is episode 42, since we've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, before we get to my like real next question, um, one of the things I struck me in the guidelines was that uh, they said that up to half of the patients don't actually have some of those cardinal symptoms or signs of infection. So I was hoping you could maybe talk us through how to parse through somebody coming in, like say this looked a little different, like it was a little smaller, he, his white count was normal. Like how do you sort of approach somebody where you're like, they have diabetes and they've got something gnarly on their foot, but it doesn't quite exactly look like I'd expect? Like, how do you kind of go through that? Yeah. So it can be challenging because 
some of those same factors which we just discussed can impact kind of those cardinal signs of inflammation that we discussed earlier. So if someone has significant neuropathy, they may not have any pain. And so they may not say, no, I have no tenderness associated with this wound. Or um, if they have a a decreased vascular supply, you may not get that kind of redness and erythema that you're used to seeing because there's decreased blood flow. Um, And so you can't always rely on, on all of them. I think, you know, if you have, you know, a couple of them that's that's always concerning, but there are other um, kind of physical exam findings you can also use to kind of assess whether the, the ulcer is uh, particularly in the setting of diabetic foot ulcer, if the ulcer is at risk. And so um, ulcers which have been present um, for a long time, so usually that's defined as like 30 days, um, would be concerning for infection. Ulcers that aren't healing despite receipt of appropriate wound care um, would be concerning for possible infection. So, um, you know, those aren't as reliable. There are other things which can lead to more chronic or non-healing ulcers, but those would also be kind of red flags in terms of uh, concern for infection. And maybe even somewhat along those lines. So Mr. Footington came in, got an x-ray, didn't show any bony involvement, I just feel like I'm always being told by somebody to get an MRI. So is this something that like is, you know, rooted in some sort of evidence or is this some sort of like old thing that just keeps getting passed down or... Yeah, I, I'm asking for permission to stop ordering them, but I have a feeling that's not going to happen. Yeah, so you've you've probably been told by by many different specialties to order an MRI while caring for a diabetic foot. I'm sure uh, we in ID um, at Cash Slack have told you to order uh, this MRI. I'm sure um, some of your surgical colleagues have told you to order an MRI. Um, and so, I mean, there is a reason behind it. Um, so there is rationale for for why we recommend it. Um, and so an MRI really is useful uh, in when you're trying to determine whether or not someone has osteomyelitis. Um, And maybe the kind of clinical features or lab markers or other things you might be using to try to distinguish whether or not someone has osteomyelitis are kind of equivocal. Um, And in particular, uh, the x-ray, while it can be very specific if you see findings of osteomyelitis on plain film, um, the findings on x-ray lag behind the clinical exam um, by really a couple of weeks. Um, I think the traditional teaching is, you know, about two weeks at least, although some would say even longer. Um, so the fact that Mr. Footington has a, a negative x-ray um, right now at the time he's presenting for his uh, infection and, and really symptoms have only been present for two weeks, it might be a little bit early to detect osteomyelitis, um, even if it's now actually there and at the base of his ulcer, if his infection has progressed to that. Um, and so if you can't use that that x-ray, that one-time single x-ray to rule out osteomyelitis, um, and your other kind of tools for assessment are equivocal, um, then that's when you might go ahead and and look for the MRI. Um, Serial x-rays can be helpful, um, again, because if you're doing them every few weeks, um, you can look for those bony changes, and that can be a helpful longitudinal assessment. Um, But when you're in the hospital and you're admitting someone who's presenting for the first time with a wound, um, and they have an x-ray that's normal, that doesn't necessarily rule out osteomyelitis. So um, from an infectious disease standpoint, that's often when we'll start looking for that MRI, um, is trying to determine whether or not there's bony involvement, because um, that's something that will definitely impact management. Um, And sort of with the MRI sensitivity specificity in the workup space, inflammatory markers, ESR, CRP. I feel like sometimes I've been told, like, before even thinking about the MRI, you should maybe look at those. Are they relevant? Like, how do I use those if I'm getting them? Yeah, so there there are a few other markers that you can use for for osteomyelitis that are commonly used. And there's kind of like three in the initial, like not super expensive, um, non-invasive assessment. So x-ray being one of them, but we just talked about the limitation of the x-ray. Um, so the other would be um, a probe to bone test. Now that really relies on the experience of the performing uh, practitioner. And so if, if the person who's doing the test doesn't really know what they're doing and they don't have a lot of experience interpreting those, um, then that can be problematic to interpret. But you essentially you know, insert a, a blunt tipped metal probe into the wound. And if you feel a hard, gritty surface that's bone, then that's considered a positive probe to bone test. Um, And that's often considered diagnostic of osteomyelitis by itself. Um, And then when you look at kind of other factors, um, like the inflammatory markers that you mentioned, there is a a systematic review that was done a few years back, which 
uh, said that an ESR greater than um, 70 um, had like a, a sensitivity and specificity in the 80s for detecting osteomyelitis. Um, there have been other studies looking at things like procalcitonin or C-reactive protein. Um, you know, all these are kind of you know, acute phase reactant, you know, markers of inflammation. And I think they do have their use, but, um, you know, it, is someone with an ESR, for example, of 50, uh, do they definitely not have osteomyelitis? No. Um, is everyone with an ESR greater than 70, do they have osteomyelitis? No. And so, you know, it can be part of the picture. So if there were some like questionable changes on x-ray and the ESR was 100, um, and, uh, you know, the probe to bone was positive. Well, sure. In, in that situation, um, you know, maybe you don't need to go to the MRI to confirm osteomyelitis because all of your other non-invasive tests are, are confirming that diagnosis, but, um, it's usually not that black and white. And so usually all those tests are kind of equivocal or not diagnostic. Um, and so then you can move on to the MRI for that purpose. I think we're ready to advance the case. RJ, would you mind doing that for us? Absolutely. So you are called by the nurse when Mr. Foodington finally arrives to the floor. The nurse tells you that on their assessment, the dorsalis pedis pulse is more difficult to appreciate on the right than on the left. And the nurse also asks you uh, if you want to swab the purulence from the wound. So do you recommend all patients that present with diabetic foot infections um, undergo vascular evaluation? Yeah, and I, I think that's really important. Um, and I, I think maybe something that's a little bit underappreciated. I think that undergoing a vascular evaluation is such a critical step in managing patients with diabetic foot infections. And I think, you know, most people probably do like a, a basic kind of bedside evaluation. You know, they'll, they'll palpate for the pulses and, you know, say whether the pulses are present or not. Um, you know, some people may document things like, you know, foot temperature, um, but but really the clinical exam, you know, looking at things like capillary refill or, or presence of pulses, that, that's really not enough to rule out significant peripheral arterial disease. Um, so you can't really just, you know, use some of those bedside findings to say, yes, the blood flow is good. We don't need to do anything to kind of intervene and improve um, or anything to act on this, you know, potential peripheral arterial disease. Um, and so, I mean, I, I still think that's a worthwhile thing to do. I think that's the minimum that you need to do is kind of a focused clinical exam, you know, so, you know, asking, you know, in terms of history, you know, do they have a history of claudication? Um, you know, how long has the wound been there? Is this a chronic non-healing wound, which, as we mentioned early, could be a sign of infection, but could also be a sign of poor perfusion. Um, you know, look for comorbid conditions like Mr. Footington, his 30-pack year smoking history, his hypertension, his hyperlipidemia, his coronary artery disease. You know, those should all kind of raise red flags for the possibility of um, significant peripheral arterial disease. Um, and, you know, you can also examine the wound and, and look for signs of ischemia. So is this someone who has, um, you know, gangrene? Um, you know, that would obviously be very concerning um, for poor perfusion. Um, and just know, again, you know, neuropathy can mask signs of claudication. Uh, and again, peripheral arterial disease can be present even in the presence of pulses. Um, and so, you know, it's important to do that initial clinical exam, but I, I wouldn't rely on that as far as excluding um, actionable peripheral arterial disease. And so, you know, that's why I think it's important that that when you're seeing these patients, you, you really go kind of to that next step. And I understand that, you know, some people you know, may be at institutions or maybe practicing in settings where it's, it's not practical to get these things on every patient. And so I think the bare minimum is kind of what we just discussed. But I think ideally, um, you go the step further and you go to the non-invasive vascular um, interventions. And so um, that they're often done in the vascular lab. So doing things like, um, you know, an ankle systolic pressure um, in ABIs. Um, you know, that's probably the one that's most commonly known, although you have to be very careful with ABIs because particularly in diabetics, you can get calcification um, of the arteries in the ankle, which can lead to falsely elevated readings. So someone with a, a normal ABI um, may still have significant peripheral arterial disease. And so uh, there are other measurements that are often done, which can kind of help uh, try to sort out the perfusion status of the foot. So there's something called toe pressure um, which is done kind of in a similar manner. You can get a, a, a toe pressure index. Um, and then there's also something called uh, transcutaneous 
uh, oximetry. We're actually measuring like the oxygen tension in the tissue, um, which can kind of give you a sense of perfusion. Um, so those are the sorts of things that I think ideally would be done um, in every patient. But again, it, you may be limited by your practice setting. So if, if you don't have ready access to that or ready access to specialists, then I think it, it, at minimum kind of going through some of those historical and clinical features we just discussed. Yeah, I think that's like the best way to put it because I know sometimes when I'm examining the patient, um, whoever it is, I'm almost feel like I'm doing their full kind of um, neurovascular foot exam. And I'm sometimes feel like I'm trying to convince myself that they had good pulses <laughs> or good cap refill. And but in reality, like if, I think if you're really having to convince yourself, like you said, that's probably the right patient to be asking for the further evaluation on? No, I 100% agree. So if, if there's any uncertainty whatsoever in your mind, then you need to be be taking that next step evaluation. Because again, people with completely, truly normal exams may still have um, significant peripheral arterial disease. The only way you're really going to know is by taking those next steps and doing some of those non-invasive vascular studies. And so when you do get those tests back, how does that kind of guide your conversation with the patient? Um, Because often I feel like the tests end up being positive or something. And so it sort of changes the management or prognosis for the patient. Yeah. So, um, you know, vascular supply is one of the really important uh, factors, obviously, like we just discussed when you're dealing with diabetic foot infections. And so, you know, it, it, even as an ID doctor, I think it does impact my discussion. Obviously, you know, based on the results, if there's, you know, something that's significantly abnormal and our, our vascular surgeon colleagues are consulted and, you know, they'll plan the next steps for things like, you know, do they need a CTA with runoff and do they have good targets for revascularization and what's the likelihood that it helps? Um, so those sorts of things, um, you know, can, uh, you know, uh, it can help with those sorts of discussions, but even from an ID standpoint, you know, ischemia is is one of the things that that really can be predictive of poor outcomes. Um, so I know we talked a little bit earlier about some of the um, I- infection classifications, um, and you know how we classify them as mild or moderate or severe. Um, so there's there's one scoring system in particular called the Wi-Fi scoring system, which I like because it's an easy to remember mnemonic. Um, but it stands for wound ischemia and foot infection, um, and there's various kind of factors. We already talked about kind of the schema for how they look at foot infection. Um, in ischemia, they basically use the results of those non-invasive vascular studies, which we just discussed, and in use of that Wi-Fi scoring system. So combining um, you know the type of wound, the degree of foot infection, and the degree of ischemia based on um, those studies can actually help predict who would benefit from a revascularization procedure as well as who's uh, at higher risk for amputation. And so how I use that information, you know, I let the surgeons kind of do their thing for for working up the vascular disease and talking to them about revascularization if that's an option. Um, But how I would use that information would be to just tell the patient, you know, hey, there are some concerns um, with the blood supply Um, You know, blood supply is really important for healing these infections. It's how the antibiotics get to the wound. It's how the antibiotics work. Um, You know, so I am concerned that there seems to be poor blood flow, Um, you know, and this sometimes can be predictive of like a more serious complication and kind of set the stage for them that like, you know, this is likely something where they're going to need some like debridement. They might need revascularization. They're at higher risk for amputation. And if nothing else, just to kind of, you know, be honest with the patient about your concerns. And I think that also kind of helps to them kind of clarify the severity of what they're dealing with. Because I, I think we've all um, probably had some patients who are a little bit surprisingly nonchalant about some of these things. And that can often kind of drive home the point that this is something serious that we need to you know be concerned about. Yeah, I think that conversation is always hard to have, especially as like someone that doesn't do any of the intervention piece. And so it's kind of helpful to have a framework to have those conversations. I think the last kind of chunk of this before we kind of recap what we're doing is the piece of, you know, you get called asked, they've got swab in hand and asking you, Hey, I'm real pumped. I want to swab this. Like, should, should I say go ahead or should I swat it from their hand? Yeah. So swatting is not nice, but you know what I mean? I understand as a, as a microbiologist, I applaud your instinct to swat away the swabs. Um, So no, I mean, in in reality, um, so swabs have a lot of limitations, but I mean, when you're looking at these foot infections, um, 
you know, most of the time, unless it's like a traumatic wound followed shortly thereafter by infection, but most of the time, these are kind of more chronic wounds that then become infected when you look at the development of the, the diabetic foot infection. So when you have these chronic wounds, they're going to become colonized with bacteria. Um, and there have been studies that show that the results of a superficial wound swab do not correlate um, with the pathogens that are causing the infection, either deeper down in the tissue or, for example, in the bone if there's uh, osteomyelitis. Um, and so, you know, when you're doing these swabs, you're, you may just be picking up colonizing organisms that are not involved in the infection. Um, oftentimes, you may end up kind of causing future you a problem because now they may be colonized with something like Pseudomonas or a resistant gram negative or something else that throws a wrench in kind of the antibiotic plan. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really best um, to not swab these superficial ulcers. Um, now, you know, ideally, if you're going to collect cultures, you want to get a tissue culture. Um, and usually that's done at the time of debridement. And so if someone's going to go in and, you know, clean out all the necrotic tissue, like remove all this, you know, gross colonizing dead stuff, get down to, you know, where the infection is actually happening in a sterile manner, they can then, you know, get, you know, take a, a, you know, curatage off a piece of tissue or potentially bone, depending on the type of procedure being done and the extent of infection and send that tissue um, for culture. And that's going to correlate much better um, with what's actually causing the infection. Um, I think, you know, I know there may be someone who's saying, well, the only thing we have access to is, is, is swabs. And so, um, you know, if that's really the only option, it, it's still, it really has to be done in kind of one of those like sterile procedures, you know, um, but you, you can't just go around swabbing chronic wounds. You're, you're going to find stuff that just confuses everything and it's not really relevant to the infection at hand. So I shall swat away. Yep. Swat the swab. Yep. <laughs> Uh, love it. All right. So I think we hit that first half that we had in mind pretty well. RJ, would you mind just doing a brief recap before we move on? Yeah. So we were talking about Mr. Fiddington, our patient that uh, presents with the diabetic foot infection. And I think we had several great points uh, from Andrew as we went through the case. Um, specifically, I think in terms of thinking about uh, Im advanced imaging, like MRI, um, thinking about osteomyelitis, the probe to bone tests uh, being really important uh, and sometimes obviously very beneficial in that situation. Um, having somebody who's experienced with that though too, so maybe operator uh, dependence sometimes is, is, is a key there. Uh, I think another uh, key point in my mind was thinking about that uh, that Wi-Fi scoring system that that Andrew mentioned, and just you know kind of using that as a framework to help predict the benefit of vascular intervention and um, possible uh, ultimate amputation, things like that, and using that to maybe even help with some some discussions uh, with with patients and, and and your colleagues in general. And then finally, of course, you know, as Moni would say, you know, swat the swab. I, I think, I think, you know, yeah. the, one of the most common questions I feel like I get here at, at, at Cashlack is, is about, it's about swabbing that wound because there's, there's some purulence on the foot and um, just really hearing uh, just kind of emphasis about, you know, cultures, uh, swabs like that best done from tissue um, in an OR debridement kind of sterile situation, uh, not, not not the best not the not the best idea at bedside swap the swab i hope it takes off uh on that note we will i'll kind of move along with mr footington um so he's seen by podiatry vascular and ortho whoever you know your particular uh satellite of cash lag has at your hospital and uh, they recommend debridement in the operating room they defer antibiotics to me which is always my favorite isn't it yours meredith mm -hmm. always um, so, you know, clearly we've established he's infected based on his exam and all the other stuff. So he's not septic, Andrew, but I'm pretty sure I need to start some stuff. Do I just like do the whole kitchen sink, meropenem, vancomycin, mycofungin? Like, tell me what it is that I need to do and be a good doctor. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think when you're looking at this, this particular case for Mr. Footington, 
So, you know, yes, he has a diabetic foot infection. We've established that. Um, you know, we, we think it's a moderate severity infection. Um, he's been evaluated by our surgical colleagues who do think that he would benefit from a debridement in the operating room, which is great because um, we want to remove all the devitalized tissue. Um, to your point, he's not septic. I mean, he has that like kind of borderline white count, but he's not febrile. His other vital signs aren't abnormal. Um, and we know for a fact that he's about to go to the operating room for this debridement. Um, and so I actually think in this situation, um, you know, it's okay to hold on antibiotics until you get cultures in the operating room. Um, you know, knowing what is causing the infection is so helpful for determining long-term treatment um, and minimizing toxicity of unnecessary antibiotics that trying to obtain that data whenever possible is really, really helpful. And so I think you know, most of us at Cashlick have probably heard it at one time or another, probably from an ID consultant that like, hey, like, don't rush to the antibiotics. Like, let's wait and get cultures first. Um, and and it, that is appropriate in some cases. So, um, you know, when that would not be appropriate. So if someone comes in and they do have evidence of a severe infection, so they have systemic signs of inflammation or infection, it would not be appropriate to withhold antibiotics in that situation. So you really have to look at the severity of the infection and the clinical extent of the infection. So if this is also you know, an infection which is starting at the wound but is clearly involving soft tissues and you know, has a concurrent soft tissue infection and cellulitis which is going up the leg, you know, that's also not really a situation where I'd say, sure, let's sit on antibiotics. But if it's really kind of a localized wound infection, especially when we know that there's kind of a, an imminent plan for debridement and they're clinically stable, holding antibiotics for that 24-hour period so that you can get good culture data from you know, tissue or bone cultures, depending on the extent of the infection, will be really, really helpful in simplifying the antibiotic plan later. Um, so I think in Mr. Footington's case, it would be a very reasonable next step to say, you know, great, um, you're taking him to the OR for debridement. Um, antibiotics are on us, I'm going to hold them. And then, you know, once he's out of the operating room, we have that culture data, then I'll go ahead and start him on therapy. Okay. I have one. Um, is that sort of your kind of timeline threshold? Do you use um, kind of about 24 hours to the operating room? Or Sorry. is it more based on their clinical signs? Yeah, so it's more based on their on their clinical exam. Um, there's there's not like a defined time. So this is, this is kind of my you know expert opinion. Um, not really anything like guideline based, but uh, to me, it's more about the clinical status of the patient. You know, some of the patients who come into Cashlock may have had chronic open wounds that are going down, probing to bone for two weeks, and they finally just decided to you know get admitted to get all these different aspects of their care taken care of. Um, and they're really not having any signs of, you know, systemic inflammation or infection. And they just have this necrotic bone that needs to be debrided. Um, you know, if they're going to the OR in a few days and they're completely clinically stable, I'm fine waiting for a few days. Um, you know, if there's other signs of infection, um, you know, again, Mr. Footington's case, he's got that little bit of a white count. I prefer that they go sooner so we could get them started on something. But clinical stability is kind of the end all be all. But if they're clinically unstable or have a significant clinical infection, then go ahead and start antibiotics. You know, there's no guarantee that even a couple days of antibiotics is going to sterilize, you know, these necrotic areas of, of tissue or bone. So you can still get positive cultures in patients on antibiotics, particularly when they are these like kind of focuses of infection. So like if there's an abscess or these other things, you're likely still going to grow something. And I guess the natural question is, so what if Mr. Fittington was a little sicker? You know, what if he did have some signs of, you know, sepsis? What would be kind of a good first regimen to start him on to buy us some time? Yeah. So empiric antibiotics for diabetic foot infection. So this is, I, I think, one of the reasons why we talked about the kind of classification system, because the, the severity of the foot infection can often inform the empiric antimicrobials. Um, so, you know, to take it to the other extreme for a second, if this is someone who you're seeing in an outpatient clinic, who's coming in with what we would call a mild diabetic foot infection, so less than two centimeters around the wound, only superficial soft tissues involved, relatively acute in nature. Um, you know, those are usually going to be just, you know, gram positive, typical staph strep. You can usually use things like, you know, Augmentin or Cefadroxel. If they have a known history of MRSA, you might want to use something like Bactrim or depending on your antibiogram. Um, but you can just do kind of an oral focused therapy for those mild infections. In um, your hypothetical, if Mr. Footington did come in with a severe infection, 
Um, so that's a scenario where the risk of missing the pathogen in someone who's displaying signs of sepsis is very high. And so in that setting, the recommendation would be to go with broad therapy, um, which is going to include anti-MRSA and, and, and anti-pseudomonal coverage. Um, and so if he was actively septic, um, you know, he had fever, he had tachycardia, um, he had a white count of 20,000, you know, he's trying to get to the OR, then starting something like vancomycin and piptazo or vancomycin and cefepime, you know, and plus minus flagell would be helpful. Um, so, you know, the, the trickiest part, and I think a part where there's always a lot of back and forth is what about those moderate infections? So we know mild's relatively straightforward, kind of just like a general soft tissue infection. Um, we know that severe, you kind of go all out because of the, the stakes. So for these moderate infections, which is kind of how Mr. Footington is presenting in the original vignette, um, you know, there have been a lot of head-to-head -head trials for, you know, what antibiotics to use in diabetic foot infections. And by and large, they don't show any significant difference between the two compared antibiotics. And so they've looked at things like Unison versus Piptazo, um, you know, fluoroquinolones, um, just lots of different classes of antibiotics. And there's not one clearly superior regimen. And so when I kind of approach these infections, I try to think about their risk factors for certain types of pathogens and allow that to guide my therapy a little bit. Um, so, for example, um, you know, MRSA. So who should have MRSA coverage for these moderate infections? Well, there are some described risk factors for methicillin-resistant staph aureus. You can look at prior colonization data if it's available. Um, but if you look at Cashlock's antibiogram, which mirrors a lot of antibiograms around the country, and you look at the proportion of staph aureus, which is methicillin-resistant, it's somewhere between 30 and 50 percent, most likely. Um, and so that's probably high enough where you should just have everybody on empiric MRSA coverage until your cultures demonstrate MSSA, at which case you can de-escalate. But the rates of methicillin resistance, I think, currently are, are adequately high, where including that in your empiric regimen for moderate and severe infections is very reasonable. Um, you know, gram negative coverage is recommended for, for moderate infections. You know, pseudomonas is usually the big question that comes up. And knowing when to cover pseudomonas is a very difficult <laughs> uh, task. And it's one that, you know, sometimes I even struggle with in terms of patients who maybe I don't think really have risk factors for pseudomonas, but they already were started on it and they're better. And so, you know, how strongly do I feel that I can narrow them off of it? Um, you know, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at, you know, the microbiology of pseudomonas and diabetic foot infections. There seems to be some geographic distribution, so areas with warmer climates, you know, they'll say like subtropics and tropics have higher rates of pseudomonas. Um, people who soak their feet have, you know, higher rates of pseudomonas with that freshwater exposure. People who have a lot of healthcare exposure are immunocompromised. People who have been on recent antibiotics have risk factors for pseudomonas. Um, and if you don't have risk factors, then you know there is a recommendation um, that you don't necessarily need empiric pseudomonal coverage. Um, so if I were admitting every single patient with a moderate diabetic foot infection, would everyone get pseudomonal coverage? No, um, but most people are going to have one of those risk factors, and so it's often included. My general sense is that it's probably overused, but I I get why. Um, and so uh, the last kind of category that I like to think about is, is also anaerobic coverage. And so, you know, I think anaerobic coverage, um, you know, is kind of clearly indicated in, in some scenarios. So, um, you know, in the more severe infections, like if there's a presence of gangrene um, or even in moderate infections, if there's like an undrained abscess, if your x-ray that you get, which, as we talked about earlier, is a recommended evaluation for, you know, every diabetic foot infection. If your x-ray shows gas in the subcutaneous tissues, you should have anaerobic coverage. And so looking at all those features can kind of help you construct a regimen. Um, for Mr. Footington, um, in this scenario, not knowing anything about his history, um, if we assume that he, you know, wasn't soaking his foot and that, you know, he's never had pseudomonas in the past and he hasn't been in the hospital or taken antibiotics and, you know, cash lack hospital is, you know, somewhere cool right now, then, I mean, you could do something like a, a vancomycin in a unison or a vancomycin in a ceftriaxone um, and then add flagell, for example, if you have any of those features of anaerobic infections. Um, no, that that's all. I feel like we had all the, the microbes we worry about. There's a couple of things that I wanted to make sure we covered. So 
in reading, it seems like once the patients actually had like a definitive, like you always talk about source control and an ID. So like they go to the OR and they have like a really good debridement or they have all the necrotic tissue sort of given, say they came in sicker and then they had the surgical intervention. It's the timeline wise in terms of like, how long do they need to be on antibiotics after, I guess, is the next question. The two scenarios are they got the appropriate de- debridement or what or, or surgical intervention versus for whatever reason, they weren't able to get everything like it. That probably I imagine they that dictates two different plans, correct? Yeah. So it, again, it depends on the extent of the infection um, and the type of procedure done. Um, so let's say, for example, you have, you know, um, you know, a mild infection, they didn't need debridement because it was not too significant. Um, you know, generally two to three weeks, I, I like to err on the side of shorter because, um, you know, I think in general, we're learning that shorter durations can be used in all these infections. So for a mild diabetic, for an infection, two weeks is probably appropriate. Um, for moderate infections, it really depends, you know, on whether or not we're dealing with osteomyelitis and whether or not that osteomyelitis has been um, debrided. Um, and so let's say, for example, you know, Mr. Footington, um, you know, had a good debridement. And so let's say he had a good debridement. They found out that it went down to the level of the bone, um, but they think that they removed all the necrotic tissue. Um, in that situation, um, you know, guidelines used to say, you know, anywhere from four to six weeks. And in, in my practice would be four weeks because he had good debridement, removed all the dead non viable tissue. Um, and, you know, so at that point, you know, a large burden of the infection has been removed. But since there's residual bone infection, you kind of do four weeks. Um, there's some newer data suggesting that even maybe three weeks might be appropriate in the setting of, you know, well debrided osteomyelitis. Um, I think, you know, my comfort with that would probably depend in part on, you know, whether or not we had positive cultures and we knew exactly what we were treating. Um, and, and that would probably play into that a little bit. Um, you know, if you had a infection that, let's say, you, you don't have that debridement and you do have signs of osteomyelitis, you know, that's a minimum of four. And typically, I'm going to go out towards six in those scenarios. So, you know, without good debridement, I tend to treat towards a longer duration. And so if he had, you know, no debridement, evidence of osteomyelitis, um, you know, I'm going to treat that for six weeks. Cool. And then one last question that's not very inpatient to you, but I just found it interesting in one of the newer articles that we read um, actually from earlier in like June of 23. Um, they mentioned um, like one of the regiment, like rifampin is kind of being used ish. Is that, did I read that correctly? Do you have thoughts on that? So like added, it's not like a, obviously one thing, it's like added to other regimens. I was kind of curious about that. Yeah. So, you know, rifampin, <laughs> I feel like has been looked at, you know, if you look at ID literature in addition of rifampin, it's been studied in, in so many different infections as an additive agent to see if it improves outcomes. I mean, there's definitely data for adjunctive use of rifampin um, in orthopedic infections. For example, we, we often will use it for, you know, uh, you know, prosthetic related infections. Um, for diabetic foot infections, it's not something that's routinely done. There, there are ongoing studies, um, and Cashlac is, uh, you know, has has been part of that study. It's a very, you know, poorly tolerated <laughs> um, antimicrobial. It has a lot of drug interactions. So, you know, to me, the addition of rifampin, at least with the data that's available right now, I, I, I don't love and I'm not routinely doing that. I think the potential for drug interactions, the potential for side effects um, are just a little bit too high to kind of be routinely doing that right now based on the data we have. Um, Going back to the timelines you were just giving before the rifampin question, um, are we presuming all of those are with IV antibiotics? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, um, you know, not necessarily. And I think, you know, one other thing to to focus on that we, we didn't touch on in terms of duration would be um, if Mr. Footington had got an amputation, for example. Um, and so before we talk about the route of antibiotics, I think um, it'd be helpful to talk about, you know, post-amputation. Um, so if people had an amputation and all of the infection was completely removed, then the duration of antibiotics really only needs to be about 48 hours. Um, now, I think the natural next question um, is, you know, how do we know <laughs> if all the infection was removed? Um, and sometimes that's, that's a relatively easier question to answer in terms of the, the level of amputation. 
Um, so if you have imaging that shows, you know, the extent of the osteomyelitis and, you know, you know where the surgeon went and you said they, they were, you know, far away from the site of infection and um, all the intraoperative bone looked really healthy and we sent cultures and we sent, you know, margins and histologically and microbiologically, there's no evidence of infection and the surgeon's confident they got everything, then you can only do a couple of days. Um, if there's residual osteo in that setting, you treat it similar to like a well debrided one and you would typically treat for, you know, an additional four weeks or so. Now, as far as which antibiotics to give, um, so oral antibiotics are are kind of having a kind of a surge in the use of oral antibiotics for treatment of serious infections. Um, you know, we've seen this for a while for things like you know complicated urinary tract infections, including those with bacteremia. Um, it started moving towards what really at the beginning of of my fellowship. Um, was kind of the dogma of, you know, osteomyelitis gets six weeks of IV antibiotics. Um, and, you know, that really changed in, in just probably the last five or six years in terms of its widespread acceptance. There have probably been infectious disease doctors advocating for this for a long time. But I think the bar was really moved, particularly with the Oviva trial, which was when I was a fellow, so probably 2019 or so, which was primarily orthopedic infections, um, but including prosthetic infections. And it was a non-inferiority randomized trial, which looked at oral antibiotics versus IV antibiotics. And they found that oral antibiotics were non-inferior to IV antibiotics. And so um, that really, I think, pushed the needle in terms of most people's comfort with using oral antibiotics for serious infections. Um, I think it's important to note that those, again, were mostly uh, orthopedic infections. So the these weren't your diabetic foot infections where there are other host factors and, um, you know, things to consider for that are kind of unique to the diabetic foot, which we discussed. So it's probably not the best idea to just directly extrapolate that and say, like, it's going to be non-inferior in every case. But I am comfortable using oral antibiotics to treat diabetic foot infections, including those with, you know, more serious infections like osteomyelitis. And I think my comfort level with that really depends a little bit on, on um you know, whether or not we know exactly what we're treating. And again, this is kind of, this, this isn't strict guidance from guidelines. This is kind of my personal opinion um, that, you know, I'm going to feel much more comfortable prescribing an oral regimen if I know what I'm treating. Um, and so if I know that, you know, Mr. Footington, you know, had osteomyelitis at the base of this diabetic foot ulcer and we cultured it and, you know, we grew, let's say, an E. coli and it's susceptible to fluoroquinolones. And I know that fluoroquinolones are, are well absorbed and get good levels in bone. And I know that his pathogen is susceptible. Then I have no qualms about giving oral antibiotics for completion of, of his therapy um, to treat his osteomyelitis. I do hesitate a little bit when we're giving empiric therapy. Um, in part because if you look at, you know, Cashlex antibiogram, you're going to find some common gram-negative pathogens or other gram-positive pathogens where um, it might be a little bit harder to, to find those drugs um, that are highly bioavailable, that get good, good um, levels in the bone, um, especially at doses that minimize side effects. And so it's not that I can't do empiric therapy, and it's not that I won't do empiric therapy, um, but I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable using orals when I have that extra data. But um, I think it's really important to, to also keep in mind that there are a lot of other factors um, outside, um, you know, in terms of the, the patient's, you know, socioeconomic background, their level of support, um, you know, their comfort level with, you know, giving themselves infusions, you know, housing situations. There are so many factors that come into that, um, that I think it, it is important to note that you can successfully treat this with oral antibiotics. And so you have to look at the patient's situation as a whole to make that determination. Yeah, I think that ends up being the most common way I've seen the orals get started is there is some other barrier to dispo and patient's been in the hospital for a long time already and has already gotten at least maybe a two to three weeks of, you know, the IV antibiotics. And that's kind of when I think the question comes back to um, like ID, can we switch them to orals to try to help like expedite a dispo? Yeah, and in some of the the switch studies that have looked at transitioning, you know, people with diabetic foot infections to oral therapy have been done with with very short courses of parenteral therapy. And so, you know, for patients who are getting their work up in the hospital and who have received, you know, a number of days and oftentimes, to your point, weeks of IV therapy, it's it's perfectly acceptable to transition them to orals. But I would definitely involve 
um, your ID consultants, um, just so they can make sure that they're they're picking the the drugs that, based on you know local micro data and, and all the other considerations, are most likely going to be effective. Make sure we're doing the right dosing um, and all those things. So I know we could talk about antibiotics all night, but we won't. Um, but I think the other important part to um, you know, this patient's treatment plan is also the recommendations that like your, our surgery colleagues are kind of giving us for offloading. Um, I think that we potentially overemphasize the antibiotics and what they can do. And so I was curious, um, especially for you from an infectious disease standpoint, how do you kind of counsel on like the importance of offloading uh, the wound as well? Yeah. So Love the question um, and completely agree that I, I feel like we, we oftentimes give antibiotics too much credit for what they are actually able to do. Um, so it is so, so important to look at all the other factors which go into um, successfully healing, um, you know, a diabetic foot infection. You know, remember when we talked about the definition at the beginning, these are infections that arise with, with wounds, typically, usually diabetic foot ulcers. Um, and again, the, the ulcer usually, you know, predates the infection. So, just because you have infected tissue and you give an antibiotic and you kill what's in the infected tissue, you, you will often still have this wound. Um, and sometimes infection is part of the reason it's not healing, but there's often many other factors, um, including biomechanical issues, the need for, for offloading, um, you know, the need to correct other kind of anatomic deformities that might be predisposing to the wound that really need to be addressed if you're going to successfully treat this and prevent recurrence of infection and other poor outcomes. So, um, I always talk to my patients kind of about four things um, that they really need to to heal their wound. So, you know, one is is they need to have removal of dead tissue. Um, if they have dead bone and they have like a necrosum and this focus of of infection, whether it be dead bone or abscess or something, um, antibiotics aren't going to get it and just magically clean up all this dead tissue. So, um, you know, oftentimes debridement is needed. Not a hundred percent of the time, but ideally debridement would occur in every case. And obviously there are cases where it can't or it won't for a number of factors, but debridement ideally done. Um, so you remove the devitalized tissue. That's that's necessary. Um, next, you need the right antibiotics. And we've talked a lot about, you know, what those might antibi right I antibiotics might look like. Um, so if you remove the devitalized tissue, you have the right antibiotics. Um, you also need adequate blood flow. And so that goes back to when we discussed the vascular supply issues and the need to really evaluate patients with diabetic foot infections for peripheral arterial disease so that we can make sure that we kind of optimize their, their ability to heal their wound. And so you really need to look at um, having adequate blood flow, not only you know, to bring in you know, oxygen and other things for the tissue, but that's how antibiotics ultimately get to the site of infection. You know, whether or not they're given intravenously or orally, the blood is what's going to carry the antibiotics to the site of the infection. If you don't have blood flow, you're not getting any of the nutrients or the oxygen or the antibiotics you need. So you need removal of dead tissue, the right antibiotics, good blood flow. And then the fourth one, is, it's kind of like a, a multi-layered thing, but I just say you need like a good wound healing environment. Um, and so what I mean by that is you need to basically control all of the factors that are potentially contributing to that wound, of which there are many. So offloading kind of falls into that last one. And I always talk to my patients. You know, one of the last things I say to almost all the patients at Cashlack when, when we're signing off or they're getting discharged is like, listen to your surgeon. Like, do what they tell you about this foot. Um, one of the most common reasons that I see people do poorly post-op is the inability to weight bear. Um, and so, you know, they they don't stay off their foot. The woundy hisses, whether or not it, it it's you know, still infected or gets a secondary infection after it dehisses, um, those patients tend to not do well. So it's really, really important to stress to them about wound offloading and listening to their surgeon about, you know, how they're going to do that. And I would take that opportunity to, you know, also, you know, talk to them about like, you know, how do you understand your, your weight bearing restrictions? Do you understand, you know, how you're supposed to use this boot or this offloading device? Because um, it's not uncommon for patients to come in and be like, I didn't realize I couldn't do this, you know, and so like, make sure they know their limitations, um, you know, make sure they don't anticipate any problems with it. So like, what do they do for work? You know, do they have stairs in their house? Are there situations where they can envision difficulty complying with these these um, kind of offloading instructions and to really just kind of work with them to address those barriers. And some of the other things that fall into that kind of grab bag category is like a wound healing environment is, you know, Mr. 
Footington is a smoker, a 30 pack year smoker. Um, you need to make sure that you tell him he's got to stop smoking. That's going to impair his wound healing. He's diabetic. You need to make sure he has good glycemic control, which will impair neutrophil function for treating the infection and also impair wound healing. Um, and so there's just so many factors that go into that, but that's kind of how I lump into those four broad categories. I guess we can actually just talk about this here because you just brought it up too, is like the good glycemic control. Um, I This is probably a me problem, but... I feel like I do not pay enough attention to their glycemic control until I'm getting ready for a discharge. And I'm like, ooh, that's kind of the whole reason they were here um, for this infection and everything. I was curious, like, how much, how aggressive, I guess, are we, should we be in maybe like getting endocrine involved or other consultants just because the glycemic control ends up being so important for the healing process? Yeah, so I think, you know, Disclosure of being married to an endocrinologist, I, I probably have a very biased view about the importance of diabetes control in general. But I mean, we do know that in terms of you know promoting healing and, and treating infection, that it's really important. Um, and I think you, we probably oftentimes have data from their hospital stay in terms of like insulin requirements and other things that that may allow us to kind of adjust a regimen or kind of improve their control. I think. You know, you can look at their, you know, A1C when they came in, look historically at what their blood sugars have been and what historically their control has been, and just really reiterate to the patient that whoever's managing their diabetes, because it's not always going to be an endocrinologist that may be their primary care doctor, but just to stress the importance that, you know, making sure their blood sugars are controlled is, is you know, equally important part of this process. So I think that's really helpful thinking about all of these like modalities that we have to think about for the like whole patient treatment process for the diabetic foot infection. Um, RJ, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what happened to Mr. Footington? Yeah, so Mr. Footington uh, gets the debridement and the empiric antibiotic coverage. Um, during this, he has a, a noted marked improvement in his symptoms and is actually getting ready to go home. He has been seen by physical therapy and occupational therapy and uh, it's recommended uh, for home with additional therapy there. So, uh, Andrew, what is your uh, anticipatory guidance uh, that you want to make sure he knows about? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this discussion often will happen before discharge, but kind of going over those same factors we just discussed about, you know, making sure he understands how important all of those different components of his health are to healing. But then, you know, as an infectious disease doctor, my kind of focus tends to be on, you know, giving him counseling on signs of infection, right? So, you know, if you notice that your your surgical wound is opening back up or you're starting to have fevers or drainage, you know, kind of giving some anticipatory guidance for signs that I would want to immediately know about, um, which might indicate that, you know, we're, we don't have control of this infection. We just spent all this effort treating. Um, I also like to be very intentional about uh, giving anticipatory guidance for whatever antibiotics he's going home on. Um, so if he's going home on intravenous antibiotics, making sure he's comfortable with the you know infusion practice, making sure that he has you know the support to do those intravenous infusions, make sure he kind of knows what that process looks like outside of the hospital in terms of you know delivery of the antibiotics, what his responsibilities will be, um, so that we don't end up with someone in the emergency room, say, emergency room saying I didn't realize what I was going to have to do. Um, for oral antibiotics or really any antibiotics, giving kind of, you know, guidance on what the potential side effects would be, both what I expect and what I worry about. Um, and so, for example, you know, GI upset's common with a lot of antibiotics. And so if someone's going home on Augmentin, for example, I might counsel them on diarrhea. And then I might also say what I worry about is, you know, a drug-induced liver injury as Augmentin's one of the more common causes. And so we're going to be monitoring lab work um, when you go home. Um, anyone who's going home on antibiotics, I always counsel on C. diff. Um, in part because antibiotic-associated diarrhea that's not C. diff-related is so common, I feel like patients often may minimize it. So I always like to give them some specific anticipatory guidance about C. diff. So like, when would I be worried about C. diff? So if you're having you know greater than three loose stools per day associated with fever or abdominal pain, um, you know that's something I'd like to know about. So mostly, I just kind of want to make sure that 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 transition to home covers all of those kind of big talking points. And um, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about like follow-up care. I know I was reading a little bit about some like multidisciplinary team approaches and things like that. And so kind of what's the recommendation for who he should follow up with and 
if you could talk a little bit about some of the multidisciplinary teams that exist. Yeah. So I think a multidisciplinary team is really the ideal way to handle this. And I think as we've discussed through Mr. Flittington's case, it's probably apparent why, um, you know, we may have a vascular surgeon who's doing an intervention for peripheral arterial disease. We may have a podiatrist who went in and did a resection or a debridement. We may have an endocrinologist who's helping him manage his diabetes. Um, we have an infectious disease doctor who's helping manage the antibiotics. So there's so many facets to successfully treating this um, that you really have to have a multidisciplinary approach. And so, um, you know, I think that when you're looking at, at you know, who's going to follow up um, with a patient, I mean, from an ID standpoint, you know, we will see all these patients in our outpatient clinic, one to check on, you know, the safety of the antibiotics they're receiving, make sure there's no side effects, uh, those concerns that we talked about before they were discharged, make sure that they're meeting the metrics that we're looking for um, that suggest successful treatment of the infection. Um, but also, you know, depending on what type of procedure he had in the hospital, you know, any sort of debridement procedure needs to be followed, um, you know, ideally with the person who did the debridement at least once. Um, they need to have longitudinal wound care, which is often going to be done by the surgeon in the setting of an operation. But let's say he didn't get any surgical intervention, he still needs to be following with somebody for wound care, whether or not that's establishing with a podiatrist or a wound care clinic. Um, someone needs to be monitoring the progress of the wound to make sure that there's not any delay in expected wound healing or any kind of regression of the wound, which would suggest a problem with the with the treatment plan. And then again, you know, whether or not it's endocrinologist or primary care, um, you know, following up with a specialist who are managing your relevant comorbidities. And so um, you know, if it's the, you know, managing the diabetes, uh, managing the hypertension, um, if he's, you know, he's a 30 pack year smoker, you know, really working with him to quit smoking, um, you know, just kind of touching base with all of those key players and, and what they bring to the table is going to be really important. And any take home points you want for everyone? Um, yeah. So I, I think we referenced it already, but really go back and listen to curbsiders, I think Moni said it was number 42, um, which is really the prevention <laughs> aspect because prevention is so important. And I know we, we had a, a, a long in-depth discussion about treatment of the diabetic foot, but ideally we prevent the patient from getting to this point to begin with. Um, and it was a really nice discussion that was done on that episode um, in terms of how to examine the diabetic foot, how to identify those who are at risk, what do you do about it. Um, and prevention is just really, really, really key. Um, you know, the amputations that are associated with diabetic foot infections are just such morbid procedures. Um, understandably, you know, patients are, are very fearful of them. And unfortunately, they're all too common, even when diabetic foot infections are, are treated appropriately in a multidisciplinary way. So really trying to prevent them from getting to the point where they develop a foot infection would be kind of one main take home point. And I think otherwise, you know, these are complicated infections, but I think you can use uh, a stepwise approach to to approaching these infections. So if someone comes in, assess the severity of their infection because that's going to help determine the need for empiric antibiotics immediately and you know urgent surgical consultation if they're presenting with like an abscess or gangrene. Um, you want to evaluate them all with a, a plain film, look for probe to bone, inflammatory markers, try to assess whether or not they have concurrent osteomyelitis if, if those are are not helpful, get that MRI that everyone's always bugging you about because it can be helpful. Um, be very deliberate about assessing for peripheral arterial disease um, and you know, involve vascular surgery um, in those cases where there's any concerns. Um, and just remember that your clinical exam may not be great for detecting that. So really try to, to push for those non-invasive vascular tests and you know, work with your team and, and your specialist to, to obtain appropriate cultures to get them on the right antibiotics and uh, make sure that you're kind of taking a, a whole health approach to the patient and not overlooking some of those other factors that we discussed. And lastly, anything you want to plug? Um, so obviously, curbsiders. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, we appreciate it. Uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, nothing personal, but I would, I would plug infectious disease as a specialty. Uh, I really do. I love my job. I love my colleagues that I work with. Um, I work with so many incredible people. Um, it's such an exciting field. There's always something new going on. Um, you know, so if, if you're a trainee or even if you're an established attending looking for a career change, definitely, you know, give ID a look, talk with your local ID, friendly neighborhood ID doctors. I'm sure they'll be thrilled to talk to you about all the exciting things that we do in ID. Um, we're, we're a really fun and nerdy bunch, um, but, but definitely give ID a look. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Mm, yummy. 
Oh, that was a good one. Still hungry for more? Yep. Join our Patreon and get all episodes ad-free plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, including our Curbsiders Digest recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please, subscribe, rate, and review the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, or email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. A special thanks to our writer-producer, RJ Blackburn, awesome first episode, and to our whole Curbsiders team. Our technical production is done by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media, and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Until next time, I've been Moni Amin. And I have been Dr. RJ Blackburn. And I am Dr. Meredith Trubit. Thank you and good night.